Hey everyone, I'm Nikisha Beckford and welcome to The Level, a podcast series brought to you by VML y This podcast creates a space where we highlight our POC colleagues and underrepresented groups within the agency. The intention is for us to talk about real topics, real issues, and real action steps that we can take to bring awareness, improve the workplace, and the work we do. We want to amplify and level up our colleagues. Let's go. I am really, really excited uh, to have you guys here today as we um, celebrate Black History Month and uh, this fluorescent takeover of the level. Um, I know we have been um, kind of chatting a little bit, um, you know, kind of behind the scenes in sort of uh, preparation for this conversation. And I am uh, excited to just be sort of the humble host and, you know, sort of uh, facilitating uh, this discussion today. You know me, I'm probably always going to drop in a little something, something because, you know, that's what I do. Um, but definitely just want to be able to, you know, just have an opportunity to, to hear from you all as we talk about, um, you know, some really important things today. So uh, maybe a quick go around the horn if everybody wants to do a quick introduction of themselves, you know, what office you represent. Um, and any little, you know, quick little fun fact about you. Let's start off with Jennifer. Hey everybody, my name is Jennifer. I'm a part of the comms team in a New York office. And a fun fact about me is that I am also a professional makeup artist. Keep the red lip. That's why you looking so fierce today. <laughs> I saw that red lip. I saw that red lip. I had to sew up today. <laughs> hey, I love it. I love it. All right, um, Tawana, let's hear from you. All right, well, I am from, I work out of the Kalamazoo, Michigan office, and I work as an experienced designer. I'm fresh out of graduate school as a experienced designer, so um, this is all very new to me, but I'm absolutely loving the journey every step of the way. Um, an interesting fact about myself is I am a fine artist, um, photojournalist um, by profession and oh, have wow. worked um, oh, as a professional makeup artist, hairstylist, all that good stuff. Love it, love it, I love it. All right, Julian, you're up. Hi, everyone. Um, of course, my name is Julian. Uh, I work for the Connections team in Kansas City. Um, and fun fact about me, I'm like one of the hugest like Harry Potter avids, so I went as far as <laughs> getting um, a tattoo, probably like two, working on like more. Um, <laughs> and I <laughs> and um, I actually recently went to Orlando Studios to actually see the uh, Harry Potter exhibits and things like that. So it's wow. a fun fact for me. But I love yeah. that. Yes, <laughs> come through. All right, and Chioma. Hey y'all, um, I'm Chioma. I work out of the New York office and my fun fact is that I've been vegan since the beginning of, oh my God, is it three years? I've been vegan since 2019. What? Go ahead, girl. I try to do a little veganism, like, you know, once-ish a week, like, you know, kind of the meatless Monday. But I just, I love me some cheese. That's like, that's, that's the hardest thing for me. Right? I'm like, the meat that's substitutes hard, have been though. there, but there's nothing like, you know, a good sharp cheddar or some blue cheese. Like, I, I that that always gets me. That always gets me. I don't blame me. you. <laughs> well, thank you guys so much. Um, I know you've seen a few episodes of The Level before, and we usually like to start off with a gratitude moment. And really for me, I'm just so grateful um, for another season of The Level. Um, really, we're looking to do a lot of amazing things um, in this coming year. You'll see a lot of takeovers this year, um, maybe a, ho a new host or two. Um, and really just um, excited for the space that we create on a regular basis 
to just discuss some challenging and relevant topics, you know, for the community um, and really being able to give voice to to our BIPOC employees here at BML YNR. And, and like I said, I'm just especially grateful um, for you all and in, in joining this conversation um, with me today, as I know, like I said, we're going to we're going to get into some real, real. So I think, you know, just kind of um, Starting there, you know, Chum, I'd love to start with you. You know, it's February, it's Black History Month, and you know, this is a time when our community really comes together, you know, in celebration of um, our history and, you know, just sort of past, present, and future. But, you know, as the calendar is, is soon going to flip to March, we start to see some of these sort of divisive isms, you know, that start to, you know, kind of maybe bring these cracks in our acceptance of the intersectionality that start to like really pull apart and I think harm, you know, our community. Um, I'd love to hear, you know, you talk a little bit about, you know, maybe some of those isms and, you know, the concept of sort of intra, you know, communal um, community harm. Yeah. So. I mean, I guess I can go back a little bit to how this conversation started. Um, it was <clears throat> the book, not as the book-ish, or I guess it was in a book, but it was more so a speech that Audre Lorde had given at a feminist convention, I believe 1979, um, in a book of her essays called The Master's Tools Will Never Dismantle the Master's House. And she was talking to a bunch of um, white feminists and it was more so about the intersectionality that was devoid or, you know, the conference that was devoid of intersectionality. There were no black women. There were no lesbian women. Audre Lorde was a lesbian woman. There were no poor women. Um, it was just white women who wanted to talk about feminism. Um, but that vision of feminism did not include most of the other women that exist or that they claim to be advocating for. Yeah. Um, and so there was a piece of her speech that I wanted to share because it could serve as the basis for what I have to say. She said, what does it mean when the tools of a racist patriarchy are used to examine the fruits of that same patriarchy? It means that only the most narrow perimeters of change are possible and allowable. Um, and I think that that's the issue that we have sometimes within our community. Um, you know, we rally together and we celebrate ourselves and you know, we push back against racism, but we don't always look at the ways that we're perpetuating harm um, within our community because underneath, well, racism bred by white supremacy, there are several other isms and phobias that are also bred by the same white supremacy. We have colorism, we have classism, we have elitism, we have homophobia, we have transphobia, we have ableism, we have texturism. And, you know, we all, you know, we say that we don't want racism, but there are so many other aspects of that same racism that we're pushing on other people. Um, and that's kind of the other aspect of, you know, celebrating ourselves, we have to hold ourselves accountable as well to ensure that we are really envisioning a world where we can all thrive and be happy as black people because we're not a monolith. Speak on it, girl. Like, you know, I, when we were talking about some of this stuff before and, you know, just talking about some of these isms, it was really like, ooh, yes. Like, you know, a lot of these I didn't really maybe have the words for in particular, but certainly kind of felt, you know, sort of the sentiment around them. Um, you know, I know Julian, like one of the isms, you know, kind of Chioma mentioned is, you know, sort of that elitism, like, you know, even around that intellectual piece. I know we were kind of talking a little bit before about, you know, those that went to college, those that didn't, you know, and like even too, like as I've, you know, evolved in my career and learning things like PWI, you know, your predominantly white institution versus HBCU, like just the ways that we even start to segment ourselves as a you know black community even having education love to hear your perspective on like you know just that kind of concept around you know sort of intellectual elitism and and maybe how that's either shown up for you or things you've experienced there yeah so um for me like Coming from my background, I was 
definitely one of few uh, growing up in Kansas City who had the opportunity to be a Kaufman Scholar. Um, and with all the trials and tribulations with being a Kaufman Scholar growing up, um, I was able to go to Missouri State University. Um, and one of the things that before going to school, I was very dead set on like, yeah, I want to do this and maybe work in HR. I didn't know what I wanted to do. And it wasn't until it wasn't until I started seeing uh, more black creatives in marketing and advertising. I was like, well, I'm not very like creative, but I'm interested to see what this industry is like. And so it wasn't until my junior year is when I really realized that I was interested in this industry and I wanted to learn as much as I could. One of the disadvantages of the learning curve when it comes to marketing in this industry is that for African-Americans, there's not very much tangible resources for us to tap into to understand this industry. So we then spend all this money in these marketing classes and then come out of these classes and like, I don't know what I just learned or I don't even know how to apply this to you know a practical sense. And so um, before I graduated, I even went as far as doing like a field survey just to just just because. And what I realized was that people wanted to be graphic designers, they wanted to be creatives in the industry uh, or social media managers, but they did not know where to start. So they're just going through the waves of what they think works and what they think sh they should do. Um, and I definitely told them that the first step is to learn, reach out to someone in the network and, you know, really get to know them. But also like I did, I put myself out there and I freelance. That was another way that I learned how to do this stuff. It was definitely not what I, <laughs> <laughs> what I thought it was going to be, but I, you know, started off doing video photography, um, whichever I could. Uh, and I feel like a lot of, um, uh, African-American students felt like, you know, there has to be an angle in, and my angle in was video and photography, and then it branched off to uh, more social things. In retrospect, when it comes to once I graduated and I was starting to network with people or just talk to people in general, um, there was a few things that stood out to me. One of the biggest things was um, high school students are starting to not want to go to college. Um, because a lot of them are really finding that, you know, depending on the industry, of course, um, it's not really valuable. Um, and so what the things that I'm starting to try to do within my community is definitely um, work on some more educational programs to help people who are interested specifically in marketing. Like for the summer, I'm doing a I'm working on a summer camp with a nonprofit to teach about marketing to minority students. So definitely trying to instill that sense of the educational bridge that people are missing. So that way, maybe that would entice them to want to go to college and be like, oh, yeah, I'm going to do something else because I already know what's this. I'm already learning. Coming you out, know, right. Yeah, something else, you know, and mix them together because that was the biggest thing for me. I did communications in school because I didn't want to do marketing because I was like, I'm not going to pass statistics. It's not happening. <laughs> it's not going to be relevant for me. And it's not. <laughs> Yo, stats is no joke. I, I, I feel you on that. And we're going to be going to talk, Julian, because I, I don't know if you know, but I'm also working on the Detroit Experience Studio which is very much about, you know, really trying to expose, you know, black youth in Detroit to the marketing, advertising, design industry so we can start to like set them, you know, kind of on that path and expose them to that early on and like I mean, this definitely makes me think, Jennifer, about some of the stuff we talked about yesterday about like even just getting to the babies, you know, early on. So I see you already off mute, so chime in, girl. <laughs> No, not even, you know, I just wanted to be ready. <laughs> I just wanted to be ready. I think as, as far as the isms, like, um, I know that we had talked about like colorism, right? As, as being a derivative of the, the master's tool, so to speak. In my personal experience, that's something that like I've dealt with like for the majority of my existence, really, like really experiencing colorism before I even knew what it was, right? You see like the difference in the way people, I guess, talk to you or the way that people like perceive you and things like that. When you're younger, it's kind of like you might see a girl like with, you know, like 
curlier hair and how much people mm-hmm. talk about her hair versus your hair, right? It starts off with those small things. You don't really know what it is, but you know that I look different from this person, right? And for some reason, she's yep, being yep. treated differently and I don't really know why, right? But it becomes a subconscious thing. I think that as I began to grow into adulthood, it really evolved into me being just very mindful about how I presented myself. Uh, particularly in the workplace, right? Because there are definitely stereotypes about Black people. We all know them, right? But I think that as somebody that presents as a darkest skinned Black person, I automatically inherit those stereotypes, right? It's kind of like there's no, maybe, maybe not. There's like, yes. Right. And so every time I and walk usually the negative me, side of it, not the even negative you know, yeah, side, exactly. Right. The neg- it's definitely a yes for me. Right. So I felt like just moving through my life, like I always have to work to disprove that in some sort of way. Right. Like I'm a tall girl. Right. So that's number one. Right. I have stature. I don't have a little Tweety Bird voice. Right. So, you know, like those were things that I had to, I guess, those were things that made me kind of shrink a little bit, to be honest, because I didn't want people to automatically assume that like I'm this aggressive person and that I take on all of those negative stereotypes just because of how I look. Um, I think that just now in my career, I'm much more comfortable um, just just doing me, (laughs) you know what I mean? It's like, take it or leave it, you know? But like changing my voice and just kind of, Trying so hard to make other people comfortable is something that I had to unlearn. Yeah, I mean, Jennifer, you (laughs) and anybody feel free to chime in on this piece because I think this is so significant of a topic. Like, and and knowing you now in this very comfortable place, you know, and I'm sure you still probably have, you know, your, you know, your inner things you're dealing with. I know we all do. Like, I couldn't imagine you any other way. Like. You know, I think that what you in what I've worked with you on and just like seeing you and experiencing you like this, this full version of Jennifer Mack is what our organization needs, is what the teams you work with need. And so I think you bring up a really good point of that when, you know, we're we're kind of struggling with these isms around us, you know, and having to sort of shrink ourselves or minimize who we are we're really not being able to bring the full, you know, sort of breadth of talents and perspective, you know, that we have. I mean, when we really talk about, you know, BML YNR's goal being the most, you know, inclusive, diverse, creative agency, it needs all of us being all of ourselves, you know, to achieve that. So I'm um, hey, preach on thing, it. One thing I wanted to chime in on with that, what she said, it uh, struck a chord with me because, and I, I brought this, I, I made a post on LinkedIn about it, but um, when I was growing up, so I will consider myself like a Gen Z millennial. So I'm like both. I don't know what you call that. Zennial, uh, <laughs> I think. No, that's a Gen Xer millennial. I don't know, something like that. Yeah. So one of the things that unfortunately that I grew up in was You can't have tattoos. You don't need to wear your hair like that. You need to act like this. You need to code switch. Like I grew up in that and like what she had just said about unlearning, like I literally uh, had to unlearn all those processes and things that people told me because this is what got them to where they are from early 2000s, late 90s. And so now we're in a whole new era. And so it's definitely time back to the whole instilling the education. Those are the things that are really important for these kids that are trying to get in this industry or be professional in general, break down those stereotypes and things like that to fit in a box. And um, I think once a lot of people have figured that out, it's like the creative juices have just been like crazy with a lot of people and comfortability. Um, because definitely, I think the first job I had out of school, oh my God, I was like, only black person there and I said very astute like it was I was very on edge and I think everyone knew that it was because you know it was not often where we get this kind of position being black and this is what I had grew up to feel like and so once I got more experience and went and did a lot of things I was like okay yeah I'm more relaxed now (laughs) yes you can bring you to work yes 
Tawana, I know we've talked, you know, about, you know, some of that, you know, kind of education, the intellectual elitism, you know, and just some of your, your perspective there. I would love to hear, you know, kind of your thoughts on that. Um, it's complex, of course, um, because a lot of what Jennifer feel or has felt or, you know, you know, the, the stereotypes that you've had to overcome or work through, um, I, as a light-skinned Black woman, have also had similar um, experiences. Um, just being overly overly sexualized, you know, um, when I walk into a room, I'm like, oh my God, I don't want to switch too much, you know, I don't want my figure to show too much. Um, it's, it's, I don't know, I think we all have, of course, um, there are stereotypes that we all are working to overcome. Um, hair texture, you know, I'm light skinned, but I have four C, three, I have like really kinky, kinky hair, you know, and um, going through a phase where, you know, I would do everything possible to make my hair straighter, you know, just pressing out my hair, all the chemicals, all the weaves, and it took me a long time to embrace my natural 4C, you know, kinky hair, which I absolutely love. Um, but I remember years ago, you know, just living in Washington, D.C. and coming fresh out of high school, um, which was in 1988, um, I um, arrived at Howard University. Um, in a situation where, you know, there was a lot of isms, you know, there was a lot of elitism, there was a lot of colorism, there was a lot of um, pretty privilege, you know. So um, during that time, you know, D.C. was very um, much a chocolate city. You know, it's not chocolate city anymore, but it was very, very uh, much a predominantly black place to live. And um, the campus there was, um, I mean, at, I arrived late in that semester, so I, I was scheduled to start school the second semester. And so I, I experienced a lot of the um, the social um, culture there. I was involved in fashion. I immediately was swept up. I don't know if you guys heard of Harvey Starr, Washington, and Derek Rutledge, and you know all those people. They kind of like swept me up, and I started doing all these fashion shows. and. And just around that alone, there was a lot of um, elitism at Howard. Or I hate to, uh, can I mention, but sorry, <laughs> but there was a lot of that, you know? So it was everyone trying to get into the fashion shows. There was, um, you know, a lot of problem, you know, a lot of um, elitism surrounding the sororities, you know? So there was just a lot of pockets, a lot of division on that campus. You know, you had light skin, dark skin, you have pretty dark skinned people and the pretty light skinned people all together. And then within that group, it was just madness. So I eventually left that experience and became very much involved in the local community there. I um, immediately, I don't know if you guys heard of Liz Nolan, um, but in Washington, D.C., there's a hair salon called Natural Motion by Liz. And she started a school called Scanners International Beauty Academy. And um, I just, I left, you know, um, Howard and went right into her beauty academy school and just really immersed myself in the local hair, makeup, fashion culture of DC. And it was the best experience of my life. I learned how to do my hair, <laughs> you know, and um, do it do it the right way, how to how to do a right, you know, my weaves were like always like on point. Um, oh. but okay. yeah, my I come see you to want to take a little trip to KZU. <laughs> you, you brought up you brought up uh, with the elitism in like universities. I know being a Greek myself, it definitely I can speak from that point of view. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think one of the biggest things, because from what I could tell, because I, I went to a PWI, so what I could tell based on the 
the way I've talked to certain Greeks from HBCUs and PWIs, it seems like HBCUs is an everyday thing. Like this is that's normal integration. This is, you know, that's them. With PWIs, although it's different because everyone wants to, it seems like everyone is like wanting to be in the organization. So everybody kind of like backs off and kind of like lets them be them. And there's just like the respect factor is different, I feel like. Um, and I'm a member of Phi Beta Sigma. <laughs> um, so I definitely, and we had to do so much and we did a lot for our community as well. So we made sure that we kept everyone very inclusive uh, from the staff, the university students, everybody. Um, but still it would feel like we were at a divide and people were treating us differently. Mm -hmm. uh, and I held the president position in my organization for two years and it never changed even with the new influx of freshmen. They all kind of swayed the same. So I don't know if that's conditioned or if it was something that my organization needed to do differently, but it definitely, um, yeah, that's just, that's cool. Well, I was just gonna say that what's interesting is, is that when you think about colors and when you think about this elitism, just the isms that we're talking about, I think that we succumb to these just out of the sheer survival of it all. Right. right. Um, I, I'm also Greek. I'm a Delta. Um, I think that uh, pledging and being brought into that organization was the first time I really understood, oh, elitism. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, but in the same token, when you are a black person, right, and you come from a certain background and you are trying to elevate socially, right, because that is how we get ahead in America. It's like you have to attach yourself uh, to certain things that are going to help to get you there. You know, um, and, and while like my membership is definitely more than not, right, it's also a resource and tool for me to to build and grow my life, right? So it, it's almost like, while I, I don't agree, you know, that like um, one group of people is better than another or anything like that, I think that sometimes you just got to do what you got to do to get ahead, right? And I don't know what the solutions are to that, where like we can kind of be this community that like mobilizes together, you know, and we all have equal access to, to that. But, but I think that especially like I'm first generation, you know, college student, you know, I think that you have to kind of carve your way through and get there, you know, and then once you get there, you can kind of figure out ways to like dismantle the system. But right. I, I think it's hard to kind of stay in one space, right? right. And it's just like, I don't want to say be mad, right? I mean, at the point, you know, like you're in this one space and you like, yo, that's whack. You know what I mean? That's so whack. But it's like, you gotta like, so, so what you gonna do about it? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, what are you gonna do? Yeah, Chiama, I would love to bring you in on this kind of this concept or this what um, Jennifer said around kind of dismantling the system a little bit, because I, I, I know you got something to say on that, <laughs> um, you know, especially, you know, like how we kind of do that from the inside, you know, or, you know, just with how we show up in the different spaces that we are. I would just I would love to hear your thoughts. It's funny, I was actually going to pose the question, do we think that it is possible to be a part of the system while simultaneously dismantling it? If we agree with what Audre Lorde said, um, which is like, you literally can't use those tools to dismantle the system that is using those same tools against us. So I, I would suggest, um, or yeah, I would suggest that maybe one has to fully divest oneself from said system. And we know from history that activism and advocacy comes with a great deal of sacrifice and a great deal of loss. So in order for one to truly, I guess, fight back against a system, they would have to di like divorce themselves or divest from it, um, which would mean loss of opportunity, which would mean loss of access, which would mean loss of mobility. And how many of us are truly ready to part with those things, especially given that many of us have not had those things prior. Um, and that's when we start to see things like black capitalism um, and people posing black capitalism as an end all solution to capitalism as a whole. And it's like, you know, we see certain famous black people and we see certain people saying that they're billionaires now and having all these corporations seeing like, that's the dream, like that's a person who made it. And I always have to ask, like, is it really? Because one does not reach a certain status without now stepping on other people, right? 
Um, which I guess kind of segues into the other point, which is, can we really root for everybody Black? Um, because folks, when we do talk about Black capitalism, the first thing that comes up is like, why are you tearing down a Black person? Or when we talk about all the other types of harm that Black folks who have made it, quote unquote, are enacting on other Black people or act enacting on other people in general, you know, there's this, well, it's a Black person and that's a win for us. And I don't want to take that win away from them because it takes the win away from us. Um, but what it really does is it now creates this culture of lack of accountability. Yeah. And we see it in movement spaces. We see it in activism spaces. We see it, we saw it all throughout 2020. You know, we were rallying against police brutality and rallying against the murder of Black men. Um, that is what brought the masses out. But then at the same time, there were Black women getting murdered. At the same time, there were Black trans folks getting murdered. At the same time, there were Black disabled people who were suffering under policies that were actively oppressing them. And when people from those communities would bring up those points, they were painted as divisive. Mm -hmm. They were painted <clears throat> as, you know, anti or counterproductive. So, I think the larger question is like, where is the space for us to have those conversations about the harm that we're enacting upon each other and the ways that we're leaving ourselves or leaving other people out of these visions of liberation that we do have? Um, and even if we are in the system, you know, because one, um, the American project is a system that nobody can escape, even when you do leave it. So if we're all existing within this system, how are we ensuring that we're protecting ourselves and not harming each other and doing the best that we can to distance ourselves um, and bringing other people with us? Yeah. One of the, oh, I, was, I talked for it. <laughs> yeah. I saw Jennifer, she was coming. Um, one of the things that um, I definitely can resonate with the most with this topic is black owned businesses. And really, when it the search for capital in there is just crazy. I can't tell you how many times I've seen in conversation, oh, that is too expensive, that's high. And there's always this sense of like, well, you should lower your prices to help out the community if you want support from the community. And there are so many different ways to look at that kind of conversation. But my point of view is, you know, it's a business, you know, making money at the end of the day. But I do feel that in a sense, in my opinion, that there is a obligation to want to give back to the community, but in a way that still services you as far as getting money, but also gives the, the service or product out to the community in a very affordable and equitable way for you. Um, as an entrepreneur myself, um, I think the biggest thing that I have found myself in was the services that I was providing to the community. I would pretty much lowball myself only because I know the disadvantages of how people treat social media and not knowing this and not knowing that. So I usually take the time to educate them and understand like these are the tools that you could use and this is what I'm offering. Um, and it kind of had a uh, I want to say double-edged sword kind of effect because although it was helpful for them, it was also one of those situations where, okay, I gave you all these tools, but are you going to utilize them and spread your wings? They don't spread their wings. <laughs> and so it's like, I can't run your business for you. Um, only thing I can do is be more of a consultant. Um, and most times it kind of just goes in the trash and I watch them on social media, they didn't do anything that I, you know, gave them advice for and actually did for them. So it's, it's a back and forth battle, but I know for myself that I'm always working towards helping out the black community and resourcing um, as much as possible. And I feel like a lot of black owned businesses should do the same, um, especially if they have, if they know another business owner that has the same kind of product or idea or something like that, they can recommend them, you know, to someone else and kind of go like that. One of the things that um, I watched uh, this Netflix series, I forgot what it was called. It was this rapper, I forgot, I forgot his name, but it was something so like, he was just a mess, but he talked about black history. He talked about the benefits of a lot of different topics. And one of the things that one of the things that he brought up was that he wasn't going to eat like he wasn't going to buy any white made products. Everything had to be black owned, period. The food he ate, where he slept, everything. And it was uh, definitely I had to put it in the chat, but it was definitely um, 
an episode that made me humble myself. And I feel like a lot of African Americans will humble themselves as well to understand that like, back in those days, like there were certain areas where you knew where you can get groceries, get your hair cut, do this, do that. And, you know, luckily, and I'm so happy that we were able to expand and actually have so many more resources to go out into different cities and do like that. But they usually had different areas. And he talked about that and about so many different things. Um, but I'm done. <laughs> I think that part of it is getting behind some of the grassroots organizers that already exist in these spaces right, um, right. that are deeply integrated with these communities that we hope to see rise up and are actively doing the work and tap the people who have, in fact, made it to the top and tell them to funnel their money back to where they came from. Right. Tell them to invest in these people that are doing the groundwork that no one else is doing. Um, because what happens is we start to, you know, we we get into these spaces and we sit and have these conversations about what should we do, what should we do, and we start our own thing. And instead of doing the the research and saying, okay, what actually already exists? Because I guarantee you there are gun control and harm reduction spaces in Wichita, Kansas, gun control, harm reduction spaces in any neighborhood that maybe has a gun problem because the people that are living right there, I promise you, are feeling it more than anybody else outside of those spaces. So right. if that's something that you want to do, you know, start looking around and seeing who's doing it already. And if there are ways to donate or support or spread awareness or get behind that, um, that's the first step, I would think. Because everything that we, anything that we're thinking of now would probably already exist. Right. And if it doesn't, there are probably people who want it to. Um, so yeah, we just have to do the groundwork and do the research and be active. Harry, when you think about it, you know, because I mean, when you start doing that work, I mean, your life at times, people will threaten to kill you, will hurt you. I mean, I've had it happen to me many times, you know, um, working in public schools, just calling a kid's parent to let them know that I need their help and would get cursed out about it. And the parent will come to the school and want to beat me up, you know, so. I don't know. What do we do? I, I think we the mental illness piece is a lot of it. Well, I don't know if it's mental illness as much as it is self-esteem and self-love, honestly. Is it connected? Um, excuse me? Is it all connected, mental illness? I, I mean, potentially, but I feel like mental illness like relies on or involves other factors, factors that may be out of your control, like literally like a hormonal or mental imbalance. I what think that's how? that kind of self-love piece, you know, like I think that that's, that's different. I think that that's about being able to have like awareness and outlook and like really having that love and support within your community. And a lot of the spaces that we're talking about don't necessarily live in uh, those types of environments, right? Where there's love and where there is support. And I feel like that trickles into the communities and how the communities are impacted. Right. And that love for self would certainly inspire, it, I think it would definitely um, lead to health, mental health care, you know? So, you know. I agree. We all need somebody to talk to. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Somebody I, talk to, that. You know? uh, I mean, I, there's so much to, to talk about here. There's so much to digest. Like, I've wanted to respond to so many different things, but we just don't, <laughs> don't well, really have time. I know. Well, I know. I think, Jennifer, as we kind of, you know, start to to get to the, you know, sort of the a uh, pause in our conversation, I would <laughs> say, because there is definitely so much more, um, you know, that we can talk about here. You know, what what are you sort of left kind of either wanting to question, circling back to what's, you know, kind of maybe a, a final thought for you and we'll kind of, you know, sort of go around the horn, you know, with sort of some last, some parting thoughts. Wow, well, I think this this conversation really evolved into like, how do we reject these isms and like build and strengthen our communities, right? And I think that there's a huge accountability piece um, that we need to discuss accountability at all levels of wealth. You know, um, there's accountability from the people at the top who are the billionaires, right, to really think about giving back. And I think when they think about giving back, it's like handouts. You know, it's just like, oh, I earned this money, you didn't. 
You know what I mean? So they're not feeling that. But I think if you position it more as like investing, right? Like there's money to be made here. You know what I mean? There's ways to build up our community so that they are valuable. I think that that's a better proposition. Um, I think that there needs to be a more organized effort for sure. I think that a lot of our conversations are just like very siloed. I don't think that there's just like an integrated effort and there's power in numbers and there's power in organization. And we just don't don't have that. We haven't had that since we lost our like monumental leaders, right? Who made those sacrifices, right? So now we have this like decentralized movement and we're expecting so much change to happen from that. And it's like the intention is there, but the structure is not. And I think until the structure is there, we're just going to be having these conversations over and over and over. But people are afraid to step into that leadership position because look what happened to our leaders, you know? And it's like, you know, we getting a little, things are a little better now, right? You know, I got a little bit of money, you know, I got a little bit of property, you know what I mean? Like, I'm good, but it's just like, are you good, right? I think that's a, a, the question she almost was asking. So I think that we, we need a plan and yeah, everybody right. needs to buy into it. They right. talk about how much money circulates within our community. And it's just like, oh, if each one of us like spare $10 a month, like, you know, right. put it into like us, this is our fund. Like we are building our wealth as a community. Right. What would that look like? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. I, I'm gonna stop there. I'm gonna stop. Yeah, there. no, it's fun. Uh, some some final thoughts from you? Oh, well, um, you know, I totally agree with what Jennifer had to say. I think that ultimately there's a fear factor um, involved, and it's just uh, just a fear of violence and a fear of the reaction that many would, you know, have to. Um, work through or encounter as they try to make these changes. So, you know, like you said, it comes down to self love, self, um, just loving oneself and, and having the resources or examples of what that love looks like, you know, the, the lack thereof is largely, um, a part of it. But when you think about self-love and when one learns how to love themselves you know then of course then they can start working on other aspects within themselves um that that promotes um healing and right thinking and right living um but the stress that people of color have had to undergo for so many years we all know that stress um produces certain hormones in our bodies you know so cortisol one is one of the main hormones or a byproduct of stress and stress leads to heart disease, um, diabetes, and all sorts of other um, psychological and chemical imbalances. So it's all interrelated. So self-love, mental health is all interrelated. And ultimately the, just the, the mere um, act of survival, when you're just that poor, you know, when you just don't have those resources, the, the stress it involves and the chemical reaction that these stressors have in your body pretty much um, immobilizes one to um, to think clearly, you know, because you're always in that, that survival mode. Yeah. So we also need to think critically about the hormones and the chemical reactions that these stressors um, um, create. So right. we can. List. Yeah, That's so we can talk about self-love. Right yeah, we can talk right? about self-love all day. But when you have chemical chemicals in your body that are byproducts of of, of stress, you can't even begin to yeah. to conceptualize what 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 self-love is. So yeah, yeah, I, I say I um, let's let's think about problem. You know, a reaction to stress and poverty for hundreds of years, um, and there have been multiple studies done, and I encourage you to um, re to study some of Dr. Fatima Jackson's work. She's um, over the um, biological anthropology department at Howard University, and she has done a lot of work on how the stress of yeah. survival, how, what it has done to, to us, so. Yeah. We well, can't. Julian, I know we got just a few minutes left. I'm I'd love talking. to hear from you, um, you know, kind of some final thoughts from you. And then Shioma, if you would wrap us up after. Um, so I think that 
um, one of the biggest things that I would say from myself would be just focus on how we can pass the information down, really. Um, understanding that, you know, not everyone has the privilege or has advantages in, the, in life, um, but it's about what we do now to help these people out. Um, looking at programs, looking at mentorship, networking, anything to really instill and pass that information down could be really crucial to the African American community. Um, I feel that, you know, we're making progress in a lot of different ways, uh, but I do think that there is a sense of, there is a sense of, uh, I don't wanna say morality, but like, we should feel like we need to do it instead of we're asked to do Imperative. it. Imperative, yeah. Um, you know, I don't, every day I don't wake up thinking like, oh, I should do this or do that. Like, I'm like, no, I actually think that my cousin who is a young 13 year old, 14 year old actually, you know, he's into gaming and internet and all that kind of weird stuff. And I'm like, well, okay you know, what can I do to help you in the future when you are about to graduate or about to go to college? Because he's teeter-tottering right now. He hasn't even hit high school about yeah. he should go to college. So what can I do for you to help you, to inspire you to want to go to school and want to get your education and your degree? Um, but that's my little TED talk. No, I love that. I love that. Michelle, I'm going to take us home. Yeah. Um... Before I do, I wanted to say, like, I agree to want to, like, there is definitely, like, we talk all about, like, you know, self-love and stuff, but, like, when a person can't find food to eat or can't go to school without fear of violence, like, there are priorities and, you know, academic spaces are very guilty of this. You know, we sit in rooms and we read theory and we hypothesize and we imagine new worlds and we're not really thinking about like, and then we yell at people who maybe are not acting as quickly as we'd like them to because I read all these books and they say, we need to act now and you're not acting now. And people are like, listen, my neighborhood is next to this chemical plant that is quite literally leaking gaseous, whatever it is into my neighborhood and people are getting cancer at higher rates than anywhere in the country. And you want us to march, you know what I mean? Um, so we need to, make sure that we're holding space for that. But in terms of like my actual last thoughts, I think it's just making sure that as we do sojourn for liberation and as we do imagine these new worlds, we're holding space for everybody that exists under the word blackness. Yeah. Um, that is every black person. Like if you're trans, if you're a member of the LGBTQ plus community, if you are dark skinned, if you are disabled, like every single version, if you're incarcerated, like if you really want black liberation, then everybody has to be included. And I know that's a really difficult pill to swallow sometimes because you think of like what everybody really means and realize that they'll be joining you when you finally do get this liberation. But if, you know, if we're sitting here and we're naming that our goal at the end of the day is to see black people be free, then we need to, like you were saying, Jennifer, like we need to all be on the same page. Like, do you mean all black people? Because <laughs> if you mean all Black people, they need to be included in all policies, in all of our marches, in all of our, you know, demands for equality. Like, there is nobody that gets left behind. And if we can agree on that, then we can agree that we have a social obligation at every point to hold people accountable when their movements don't include certain people or when their spaces are exclusionary. Um, and if we can do that, then I think we're in good shape. Yeah. I mean, I thank you, you know, all of you, you know, just for, for that. But I think we're not to like sum everything up because I don't think we can, you know, necessarily sum up a conversation of this magnitude, but in the true sense of representation matters, like, and representation in its fullest, broadest definition, you know, is kind of just where I was hearing that last piece of sort of what you were saying, Chioma, that like, the full spectrum of blackness and all of its intersections is represented in this, you know, in these conversations, in this sort of imagining of, of what the future looks like. Well, y'all, 
this was this was this was everything. I really just I appreciate the openness. I appreciate just y'all sharing, just um, you know, the challenging of each other, and just you know, kind of building on um, you know this really important important topic. I hope we get to continue this further. You know, I just um, really excited about um, just you know what we've just even scratched the surface on. So. I just want to thank everyone again for joining us for another episode of The Level. We, I hope you really enjoyed the conversation that we have. And I just want to thank you know each one of you, Chioma, Tawana, Jennifer, Julian. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, you know we love to hear from you all. So reach out to us at The Level at VMLYNR.com to share your thoughts, um, your questions about this episode, or to share um, some show ideas. So we'll see you on the next level. Bye.